I'm an only child. I was born to older parents. My mother was 36 and my father was 42 when I was born. And my parents belonged to that era of parents who believed that sons are better than daughters. Mm -hmm. They really wanted a son and they had a daughter instead. And my mother had six miscarriages while trying to get a son and I was the only one of her pregnancies that survived. But that said, my parents were very happy to have a daughter and um, I suppose it was a classic sort of Electra thing going on between me and my father. We were very close. and um, But at the same time, both of my parents belonged to a very sort of post-Victorian um, era regarding gender, about what girls and women do and what boys and men do and, men do, and the separation between the two of them. So I was raised to be a real girl. Who was I was even sent to a school. Like a girly girl, do you mean? I, I resisted the girly part, but I think I think I was expected to do the girly thing. Um, I've never quite done the girly thing, but I was sent to a school where girls were supposed to become young ladies. And young ladies do not swear, they do nothing unseemly, they don't cross their legs in public, they don't drink, smoke, or have sex. So mm. this was the code of the school that I went to and it was the code that I was supposed to adhere to. You, in addition, you were supposed to be domestically accomplished, you were supposed to be neat and you were supposed to be decorative and I, I didn't really quite fit into all of those at all times, I need to say. What era was this, if I may ask? This was in the previous millennium, <laughs> yes. the 1970s. The 70s? Yes. Because mm. interesting, it's the 70s were also time of the so-called sexual revolution, the pill, certainly in, in, in say the United States, but South Africa I presume was where you grew up, that revolution didn't quite come then. Well don't forget I was also um, raised in the Anglican Church and I was confirmed in the Anglican Church. The Anglican Church is also not very much in favour of the sexual revolution. In fact as far as I can see the Anglican Church is not in favour of sex at all. <laughs> So, and certainly not, I mean, for me, growing up as a young lesbian in the closet, right. nothing was encouraged. There were, you're not even supposed to have sexuality. We were given little pamphlets about, you know, why sex before marriage is wrong and how to cure homosexuality and a lot yes. of other things like that. So, no, there wasn't a lot of revolution around. <laughs> <laughs> the revolution sort of came a bit, bit later, I think. Um, I grew up in Gozulu in a town from okay. Marisburg, and it was a little bit behind the, mm. the States. So while there may have been a revolution in sexual mores in the States in the 60s and 70s, it sort of really happened in South Africa around about the 80s. Yes. So when I had in fact already finished my university and um, was, was beginning, beginning to work as a young professional. Yes. Mm. So do you remember pushing back against those gender requirements in, in obvious or subtle ways? I think I was more on the subtle subversion uh, side of the continuum. I wouldn't wear dresses. That was a, you know, little girls are supposed to wear dresses and are supposed to, you know, the dresses both look like meringues. Mm -hmm. And I, I was opposed to these things because they restrict movement. Mm -hmm. I wanted to climb trees and run around and so on. So that was a, a sort of a subtle form of rebellion. Um, as regards so-called proper behaviour, I was more or less despairing about how proper behaviour is ubiquitous. Everybody's supposed to behave properly. And so I sort of despaired about being able to behave improperly, so then I didn't behave at all. So I, I engaged in passive, mm -hmm. passive withdrawal from... Passive uh, resistance. As it were, yes, very quietly. And as regards domestic accomplishments, sewing, knitting and cooking, I just couldn't and that was that. Yes. And I wasn't interested. And I just tried not to engage as far as possible. At what point did you begin to identify as a lesbian? And how would you say that that um, framed the way you thought about gender and gender roles and norms? I can tell you how I thought at the time. It's not quite how I think now. Mm. At the time, I thought that um, lesbian object choice and lesbian sexual orientation 
had something to do with gender non-conforming identity. I don't think that anymore. I now think that sexual orientation is kind of given. So, but this was, um, once again, quite a, quite a long time ago. It was in my early 20s. It was actually when I left home. Right. And when I left home, um, I began to realize the, the stranglehold that the church had had on me and on my way of thinking. And I began to throw that off and experiment with other things that um, young people did, going to clubs, um, dancing, coming home late, all those kinds of things. I, I lived a fairly sheltered um, upbringing in a quiet backwater of Primerisburg. Um, <laughs> and I, I started to understand myself as lesbian and I started to to be more at home in it. But I still don't think that it has much to do with gender performativity. Uh, although there's a stereotype yes. of the butch lesbian, the dyke, the leather jacket and the tackies and there's etc. Um, I don't think it's a necessary relation between that and sexual orientation. I'm, in my life I've known at least two or three lesbian women who, who were in the early lesbian adult vibes quite butch I suppose mm -hmm. you could put it that way and have since come to the realization that they are trans men mm -hmm. and so that for me is an slightly complexifies that mm -hmm. question around gender because you know they they were quite masculine in their appearance as women and it, those things are separate but it's some but in them they've become interwoven well it quite definitely does complexify the matter but then i think there's also a lot of gendering in there's a lot of unequal power in how men and women are supposed to look and behave in, t in terms of the conventions. So um, high heels, short skirts, um, tight corsetry and so on is really not defined, not, it's really there for the male gaze and it's really there to, it confines a woman quite badly. Um, and I've always found that. Whereas masculine clothing and appearance is very much more free yes. in terms of you can move more easily, you can sit in more relaxed ways, you can just do things. With, you're not so aware always of the clothes and the things that you're wearing and the way you look. Um, so I think that it's actually encoded in the fashion industry, mm -hmm. this, um, this masculine and feminine clothing and, cl and codes of behavior, yeah. that men just get more freedom in the, in the clothes they wear than women do. You know, and also the, the this ridiculous requirement for thinness that yes. women are supposed to have. And by the time you actually are thin enough to fit into some of those things, you probably in need of medical <laughs> attention. So, I mean, this is not to say anything about your friends who've recovered, who've decided yeah. that they're trans yes. men. Yeah. I think that, um, Look, it's not it's not an other or choice either. There, there's a spectrum of gender performativity. Were there any interesting role models of women who have broken the mold? Because I suppose one of the interests of our work in this project is is powerful role models, women who are uh, different, who have agency, or find ways to walk a different path. Um, I think I would mention some of the teachers I had at school. Um, in particular, I, I had a French teacher who had a doctorate in French and Italian. And she, she was a role model for me of an intellectual woman, a woman who had decided she was going to do what she wanted to do and get this degree and use it. Um, and that, for me, because I always aspired to being clever and academic, mm -hmm. and I'm still aspiring to being clever <laughs> and academic. And so she, she was a model for me of that, and she wasn't constrained by things like marriage and family. She d and we, um, we asked her, actually, once in the first class, what about family? And she said, well, it's not as important as what she wanted to do. And I thought that was extraordinary. It actually was extraordinary for the 19, 1970s. And I'm interested also, you know, that the, 
that relationship between the social influences that we all have, but also something inside a person that may be almost, I will hesitate to say intrinsic to them, that is also a driver that meets the social and they have that complex relationship with each other. Well, might be. I mean, I'm not an extrovert yeah. and I'm never going to be and I've finally accepted this and I'm not going to be a performer of any yes. kind. And I really do like knowledge, speculation, theory, philosophy, ideas and the mind. And I think I've found a niche there. But I've also found in the writings of other people, some of whom belong to the 60s and maybe in counterculture, I've found role models that I can actually follow, which which have said to me, but why do people, why do women have to get married and have yes. 2.5 children yeah. and then be economically dependent on their husbands? Why can they not be financially independent? Why can they not be intellectually independent and sexually independent and independent in terms of movement? Yeah. And so, you know, that, that was help yeah. you know, in terms of, of acquiring agency. You know, when you were talking about our socialization about boxes and those often around gender, mm -hmm. um, that the a, a more sort of superficial understanding is that that's, and often people put this forward, is that it's about order, that it structures society in ways that is useful and manageable and everybody knows where they fit in, which leaves mavericks out of the question, of course, but also perhaps the elephant in the room is patriarchy that those boxes and those that order serves a particular purpose. Unfortunately it does. And I've never, I, you know, if I've tried all sorts of logical systems, I've never quite seen why patriarchy should be reproduced. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's done human beings much good. And I don't see why we need to pop it up. Now, I'm moving from um, your upbringing to your professional and academic life, could you briefly sketch out how you came to be where you are at now in running a gender unit or program at UNISA? Well, it was a rather roundabout pro um, um, journey. I took a liking to science fiction and fantasy. Well, once again, a rather unusual sort of fringe thing to do. And I encountered feminist science fiction and mm. fantasy. And I was absolutely amazed by it. Because in feminist science fiction and fantasy you find lesbian separatist utopias. You find I think it Marge Piercy, didn't she write? She did. Something like that, yes. She did, but I mean even earlier. Uh, yeah. I've forgotten who wrote Millennium Hall, but it's a nineteenth century um, 19th century feminist, mm -hmm. uh, lesbian separatist utopia, and so is her land, also in the 19th century. And I read all these things with absolute fascination. And then that led me to the question of how, how does this gender binary come to be, and how is it so deeply ingrained in our world? Particularly the book Left Hand of Darkness mm -hmm. by Ursula K. Le Guin, where there's a world without gender, where people have sex, but only um, only for a week every month, and you develop as sex and you become sexually active for that week. The rest of the time you don't have sex or gender. And this is an extraordinary thought experiment and it makes you think about what, what is the impact mm -hmm. of sex and gender, of the sex and gender system on us. And that led me to reading uh, feminist theory. I'm still reading feminist theory, I haven't got bored with it yet. That was about... It was 20 years ago, and I haven't got bored with it yet. So, after some time um, of, I did my studies and I graduated, the Institute for Gender Studies at Junisa was advertising a petition for a head. And I applied, because I'd been involved with it from its inception in the 1990s. And I applied for it, and I was the only person either brave or foolhardy enough to apply, so I got the job. I mean, you're a relatively small unit or group of people, like a lot of gender work, I suppose. How how do you prioritise your research agenda? Well, it's happened because people are interested. I mean, there was there was the, the, a request to the institute to do research into gender-based violence in higher education. So, so we took that up. I was interested in that, so I took it up and I started a project going. 
And the rest of it is literally according to people's people's proclivity. So the researchers in the institute are sort of chosen because they they cover particular niche areas in the study of gender, LGBTQIA interests and masculinities and um, a sort of a social sciences approach to gender. But then again, I, I'm not the I'm not a very autocratic manager. So if people are, if a colleague says they're interested in this, I'm not going to stop them from pursuing it by saying, no, we don't need that. I mean, nobody really wants to study, um, you know, gender in 14th century England. Mm. You know, so it's not like anybody's doing anything that's not topical or relevant, but it just happens that the, it happened that the, these are the people we have. What would you say could be a useful working definition of the term gender justice? Or what does it mean to you? I think I'll go with what it means to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Given that um, patriarchy has oppressed women for centuries and centuries, I'd like my idea of gender justice would have to be an undoing of that oppression first and foremost, um, and in particular the types of race and gender oppression that we see impacting upon South African women and uh, today, in 2018. I would like that to be undone first of all. And then I would like to see freedom for sexual expression, freedom of sexual expression and gender expression for um, sexually diverse identities for LGBTQIA people. So, and for that to be okay, because right now it's, okay in some circles and not okay in others and I, I've never quite understood it actually. Um, my idea of justice though is also not retributive, it's, retributive. Yes. Mm. it's not where we should punish the perpetrators of violence or the oppressors, it's more restorative and yes. just simply working against cultures and mindsets that make people prejudiced and bigoted towards people of other genders and sexual, ident sexual identities than themselves. Mm. Uh, you talked a little bit earlier about how gender-based violence seems intractable. Um, why do you think, because that's an element of, a clear element of gender justice is that you know, mostly men as perpetrators, um, formed I suppose by how men are raised and social norms women as victims. There seem to be so many ways we've tried to combat it in South Africa through, through um, lots of community work, um, laws that are on paper very good. Um, can you speculate on why that violence is so resistant to change? From, from the side of the victim, I would say shame is a huge reason why gender-based violence is so intractable. Right. Because my, the, the feeling of being shamed by being um, a victim of GBV is a reason that silences people. And it, when you are silenced, you don't find community, you don't find support, you sink into a, a horrible psychological cycle of self-dislike and... Despair, even. Yes, and, and then negative and self-destructive behaviour, even. And so that's one of the reasons, I think. And I mean, and then the, the shame that victims feel and often express is then secondarily reinforced by the justice system, which so often shames the victim. And what did you do? What were you wearing? Where were you? Were you alone? Etc. Etc. Um, so I think that needs to be addressed. But that would need to be addressed on an individual basis, that on almost on a case by case basis, also structurally by addressing the justice system mm. and not casting aspersions on victims who do report to say, well, what did you do to provoke? Then in terms of the perpetrators, um, I think that South African masculinities need a bit of attention. I think South African masculinities tend to be constrained by ideas, by outdated and inapplicable ideas of what is a real man mm -hmm. in South Africa. So a real man 
is a strong person who not only doesn't cry but earns a lot of money, provides for his family and, dom and runs the house. And I don't, really don't think that those ideas are actually viable any longer because we're living in a deteriorating economy, a deteriorating world economy for that matter. And ruling your house when you have empowered uh, women, you know, adult women and daughters in it, it's going to become very challenging <laughs> going to cause issues. So, so these things need, need to be addressed. And I think masculinities need to be worked with, um, but need to be, need to pay, get a lot more attention than they're getting. Yeah. But all of that said, I, that's what I think. I don't know if that's actually true. I don't know yeah. if it would actually affect the rates of gender-based violence. When you use the term gender equality, I think sometimes you, what you find is it raises anxieties in some people in communities where they say you're implying that men and women are the same. Um, and so you can get into this tricky terrain of, of starting to say, well, what are their biological differences? And then those can be overstated and essentialized. Um, and then in the mix, I suppose, is people who are intersex, um, trans people, start to challenge the idea that there is separateness. Do you have a, a way out of this maze that is helpful for us to think about the term gender equality? I like to be provocative. And then I like to tell people that they should be feminists. Right. And then I tell them that a feminist is a person who believes that men and women um, and trans and intersex people are all human. So whatever your definition of human is, um, the, com the psychological complexity, the creative potential, the spiritual depth, the entitlement to fulfill your dreams, it applies equally to all people. And I think that's a way out of it. Because quite often, um, so for example, with the, the widespread idea that you don't need to educate your daughters because they're just going to get married. Yeah. Well, daughters, if, if you think of your daughter as being equally human with you, then your daughter might have a right to her academic dreams being fulfilled or her professional dreams being fulfilled. She might want to be a rocket scientist. She might have a right to want to be a rocket scientist. You know, and I think if you see, if we if we start to see the human, however we conceptualize the human, if we start to extend that to others with a capital O or without a capital O, then we get closer to ideas about equality. If we're all equally human, then we don't all have to be equal or identical, because that that in itself is a, yes. a nonsensical idea. Yeah. There are pushbacks around hard-won freedoms and equalities. Do you remain optimistic or pessimistic or um, a little bit mixed? Something we haven't talked about is intersectionality. It was in my head earlier <laughs> when you were talking. And it's about the intersection between yeah. gender and race. Mm. And what I'm seeing in, in the world today is a move towards conservatism and bigotry around race. Mm and around, I mean, there is a, there's an upsurge of white supremacy, white supremacism and racism and xenophobia of all sorts and sizes. So that makes me feel pessimistic because sometimes you just feel, well, why are you bothering yeah. talking to or, or trying to say, look, you know, uh, people are people. But then when I, I do, this is what I was talking about quantitative data mm. earlier on, mm. I do think people are becoming more understanding about sexual and gender diversity. Um, maybe it's just the circles I move in or the, the people I know, but I, I do think there's a, an acceptance. It's, it's slow and it's uneven, but I think acceptance is slowly coming. But we can't talk about, you can't talk about sexual and gender equality without talking about racial equality as well. So mm. it's, kind of a, it's kind of a mixed bag. Yeah, you, are you left feeling there's something you wanted to say, haven't said, or would like to put out as a, your thoughts or thoughts about gender? Well, I, I think the more publicity and airtime it gets, the better. And I think that publicity and airtime needs to be in the public space. Mm. 
So, I mean, the total shutdown and the march and all of those kinds of things, even the Me Too campaign um, and all of those types of things, it's all good and let's continue doing it. But then let's also remember that we have an activist agenda as well as an academic agenda. Thank you.